So to get started, I want to introduce Carol Kidney Arbrewster. She's a senior lecturer at Indiana University School of Public Health. Carol's master's thesis was group water fitness. She, she knows group inside out, that, that's for sure. She has an incredible textbook, the best there is, Methods of Group X. She co-authored it with Mary Young, another superstar in, in our, our profession, in our industry, in our world of fitness. And there she is, the favorite format cycling, Carol Kennedy Armbruster. Next, so I want to introduce Mike Spazano. He is the ultimate in with program leadership. Many of us who work on the ACSM Health and Fitness Committee know what a leader he is. Mike's YMCA career spanned 35 years, including 12 years as YMCA of the USA's National Health and Fitness Consultant, and most recently as Vice President for Programs. We all know him very affectionately in, in this audience as ACSM's Health and Fitness Summit and Expo Program Chair. He's done an outstanding leadership job with the summit. I'd now like to introduce Dixie Stanforth, Senior Lecturer, Department of Kesonality and Health Education, the University of Texas at Austin. She serves on the editorial board of the ACSM Health and Fitness Journal and the Gatorade Sports Science Institute. Very prestigiously, she has received the inaugural department Teaching Excellence Award in 2011. Dixie Stanforth and Kelly Roberts. Some of you know Kelly very, very well. She is a pioneer of movement in our field and still a leader in movement. 2003, I did International Fitness Instructor of the Year. 2007, Kelly was inducted into the National Fitness Hall of Fame. Her award-winning DVDs demonstrate her exceptional teaching skills. She's recognized for her fitness innovation contributions to the health and fitness industry. Kelly Roberts will be up very shortly. I'm going to start it with just a, a a brief overview right now. Many of you know President-elect of ACSM, Walt Thompson. He's done for 11 years this incredible worldwide survey of trends in our field. So insightful for all of us. And I'm going to share with you some highlights of the 2007. It was sent to 24,296 health and fitness professionals. They received 8% response, which is very, very good for this type of survey. You see all the different countries where professionals responded. It was indeed a worldwide survey. And when you look at what are the top 20, you know right away, Wearable technology is really very popular. It seems people are inspired, fascinated with monitoring and getting immediate results. And, and, and I think this is just going to keep growing. Body weight training, which is minimal weight training as it's defined, shows you that all forms of resistance training are very, very popular. To me, without a doubt, high intensity interval training is a flagstone. It, 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 it's a mark that's gonna be with us for a long time. This type of training, every day a new study comes out seeing what wonderful results we, we get with this form of training. And incredibly impressive, Educated, certified, and experienced fitness professionals shows us that our industry is growing and people aspire to be, you know, colleagues to our, to our field of interest. Group training, more than five participants. This is amazing. It's been around the longest and now it's hit the first year in the top 20. And I think it's just going to stay there. It's going to get more and more. And then, as, as we see here on the next, exercise is medicine. We've seen it throughout this whole, whole conference. And this is the first day. The collaborations of physicians with our, our profession. And Mike's going to cover this very, very thoroughly today. Looking again at the top 20, we see personal training. And we realize that people realize tremendous benefits with one-on-one -on -one type of training. And I see this as just an incredible skyrocket launch that, that's going to keep going as well. Looking at the top 20, 11 to 20, just to highlight 
group personal training, two to four participants. Kelly's going to really update this. Uh, this, I really see, and, and you'll, you'll see, is going to continue. It's been in the top 20, and it's going to continue to grow. It, it, it's just there's too many great ways you can do small group training. And then circuit training. Uh, I believe in the next few years, we, we have a lot of new research going on. A lot of it is with some of my grad students in the audience right now, and it's going to be hot because we're learning new ways of doing circuit training that we're all going to really, really enjoy. And without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Carol, who's going to come talk to us about the future of group exercise. Okay. Thanks, Len. So um, one of the first things I did is look at credentialing and um, the trends in credentialing of group exercise instructors. And the NCCA is the, is, the, is the new standard now for credentialing. And ACE still has an ACE um, group exercise certification. And there's another one, NETA, exercise training. And there's a new one coming up through the military called NAFTA. But there's not as much emphasis on group exercise certification. Um, but it's still there, and it's still holding strong. And, and then, going back to Len's trends, um, only this year did group exercise training make the top 20. And, and that's interesting, because it's been around for so long, it kind of went away, and now it's coming back. And I think there's a lot of reasons for that. And uh, who took this survey? It was a lot of young people, which is interesting because I think um, there's more young people that are getting into group training than in the past. And what has lost its luster? Um, Sports-specific training has. Um, exercise programs for overweight kids has lost its luster, which is a little bit sad, I think. Um, and then what Group X classes were not in the top 20 was group cycling, water X, Pilates, and running clubs, which is interesting again. And again, this is just um, out of the ACSM trends. There's another survey done by Club Intel that is more, um, this is, uh, our ACSM survey is done by fitness professionals. Club Intel is done by people that um, work for URSA and are more a part of the big box clubs. And Steve Therrett is behind this. I know Steve and he's a really great um, fitness manager. He knows a lot about that. So he surveyed 193 different people. 67% were from the US, so part of his was a little more international. And what are the staples for club offerings in group exercise? 65% offer boot camp, 56% offer HIIT, 53% offer yoga, and 49% offer indoor cycling. So it's interesting, this survey's a little different than the ACSM one that said cycling was on the way out, whereas I think in the big box clubs, it's a little different. So you have to look at the different surveys that are out there and, and, and who they're surveying to know a little more about group exercise. Here's another, some more predictions by Club Intel. What's hot? There was a 390% increase in virtual group exercise. And that's interesting. I, I even see it offered you know, on commercials on TV now. And Wexar is probably the biggest one that is out there. There was a 177% increase in bar classes. 157% increase in event style classes. That's that mutter type things, I think, I believe. And an 87% increase in HIIT Group X classes. What has lost its luster, according to um, Steve Theretz, is there's been a 25% decrease in Latin hip hop dance between 2015 and 16, a 30% decrease in TRX or suspension training a 21% decrease in marathons or triathlons, and a 33% decrease in dance-related classes. So you get an idea about what's in and, and what's not. Um, and then, um, what group exercise classes did really well in the last survey? There was a 96% increase in virtual group X, 
86% increase in the event style, 57% increase in suspended yoga, and a 23% increase in Pilates. And then on the right side is, is the Wexer launches partnerships with club virtual cycling. We're seeing this on, I, I work on a college campus and we're seeing this where a lot of the new housing places for students are putting this in as an option um, for the students that live in these complexes. So I think this is gonna be something that will be interesting to see what happens with virtual group exercise. So what, what is the future? I think that group exercise is in. I'm excited about that. I, I've been doing it for a long time and it was really in, kind of went away a little and now it's really coming back. And I think some of that is because people need instruction. They also need accountability. They need socialization and they're really interested in some sort of outcome. I think there are some new things that have really done well lately. Uh, I'll mention Orange Theory as one of those. And that particular setting, you go in and you sign up basically for a group exercise class. So the places that are running organized group classes where there is integration and socialization, as well as you're given a workout, um, are really making a difference. So I do think that structured um, movement led by a professional is not gonna go away. I think it's only gonna get bigger in the future. So on that note, I'm gonna introduce Mike and he's gonna talk to you about the future of healthcare. Thanks, Carol. So in a nutshell, I think the future of healthcare collaborations between healthcare providers and health fitness facilities is very bright indeed. I think there's gonna be many more opportunities for collaboration, and um, I'm gonna give you some tips into how you might uh, move in that direction. And um, I think it's gonna create more opportunities for health and fitness professionals. So you heard Len talk about the trends, and uh, the health and fitness trend number seven is exercise as medicine. And that's relatively new that that's been appearing on the list. Exercise as medicine, uh, for those of you that don't know, is an initiative spearheaded by ACSM to have healthcare professionals talk more about physical activity as a vital sign with every patient that they see uh, first. And secondarily, it's also a, an initiative to connect healthcare professionals with health and fitness professionals, uh, which would create opportunities for folks like us. So it, it's um, number seven, it's, it's pretty high. Yeah, and for the first few years of the lifespan of exercise as medicine, it mostly focused on healthcare professionals. Uh, now there's a credentialing program for health fitness professionals uh, to become a preferred uh, referral source as doctors look to get their patients into health and fitness programs. They look for providers, credentialed providers, um, and that's where uh, we come in. Other notable trends related to this, and you'll see I picked up two. Number four, educated, certified, and experienced professionals, as well as outcome measurements. I think those are key markers for health fitness professionals to remember, that doctors and healthcare organizations that want to refer patients to become your customers, they're looking for folks that they can trust. When a doctor turns over a patient to a health fitness uh, professional, they want to know what is that person going to do with my patient and how am I going to know what they're doing and what are the credentials of that person. One of the things that make doctors kind of nervous is that the health care, uh, I'm sorry, the health fitness profession isn't regulated as far as uh, licensing like other professions are. So it makes doctors kind of nervous. So they want to know that the people that they refer to are credentialed and creditable and will do, and will do no harm, if you will, to their patient. So it's, it's an interesting that that's popping up as a, a trend among fitness professionals. And number 18, outcome measurements, what are the results of what you do with those patients? What happens to them? Do you have data to show that health uh, care markers indeed improve. So th I think those are key uh, markers related to collaborations with health fitness, health uh, care organizations. 
So I think health fitness centers can help fulfill the promise of exercise as medicine, which is extending the continuum of health from uh, wellness uh, to activity uh, to sickness and in including uh, everything that is done to keep a person healthy. There are certain things that doctors have to do when there's uh, acute illness, when there's surgery requires, required, doctors have to do that. But there are things that other providers can do with patients, uh, like health and fitness professionals. So I think health clubs have the potential to be that resource for doctors that are looking to get their patients into the community, get them into wellness programs, and increase the likelihood of their, of their rehabilitation from whatever it is that they see the physician for. Uh, health clubs have that kind of safe, supportive environment that people can pursue a life style change, uh, such as increasing physical activity. Fitness pros can work with doctors and other healthcare pros for referral and service delivery, as well as an opportunity through medical wellness programs for uh, people like you, people like us, to work with a, a new population. Uh, folks that may not come into your regular programs and services, but might come in to a cancer exercise program, or a diabetes wellness program, or a cardiac therapy uh, program, or physical therapy that's referred uh, by a physician. So a lot of this is being driven by uh, healthcare reforms on the national level. In the, right now, healthcare organizations are rewarded for volume of services, more procedures, more tests, more medications, and that's the reward mechanism. The shift is to reward for outcome measurements, that indeed these things help keep people healthy, or activities given beyond the acute care given to a patient uh, in, in having them improve their health. That's called um, values-based purchasing versus fee-for-service, which has kind of been the norm for healthcare uh, reimbursement for many, many years. So value-based um, purchasing means that they're going to be held, it's called accountable care. Healthcare organization is going to be held to uh, show that they indeed have healthy outcomes for their patients beyond just having a test or having a surgical procedure. And a lot of that involves this personal accountability and wellness. So it's not just what happens to them in the healthcare organization, but when, what happens after that? How does this person go through rehabilitation? How do they transition to a lifestyle and physical activity program? And who does that for them? Is it a coach? Is it a trainer? Uh, or other health and fitness professional? So it's this continuum of care from sickness to wellness. And many healthcare organizations are finding that the, one of the best ways to do that is by partnering with an organization that specializes in us, and that's the health and fitness profession. Not necessarily doing it themselves or creating it themselves, although some might have their own centers, but finding uh, organizations and, and companies in the community that can provide that service for them. So this is kind of a laundry list of what medical wellness programs look like. Very few organizations that offer medical fitness will run all of these things, but there's some on there that uh, many do, and some might specialize in one or more. But there's, there's a lot of programs that go beyond traditional health and fitness that need uh, extra credentialing. You might need a referral from a physician to, uh, to work with patients that need to go into a stroke rehab or a pain management program. But these are programs that can be run in health and fitness centers with the right leadership and with the right connection with, with the healthcare and doc doctors. This is one example. You saw from that slide that I spent my career working with YMCAs, so it stands to reason my example is the YMCA. This is a relatively new Y outside of Indianapolis in, in the suburb of Avon, opened a few years ago. It's a facility that was built with a hospital on hospital property. It's 105 square feet. It's about split half and half. So in half of it is a traditional YMCA. It's a fitness center, it's a pool, there's kids programs and all that you might find, childcare in a Y. The other half, there's a family physician, there's a physical therapy clinic, there's a, there's a diagnostic lab, uh, a blood lab and uh, MRIs and all that. And it's a great, it was actually um, developed mostly through the leadership of the hospital that said we want to be in a facility in the community where our patients can go right into a program like physical therapy, not be in a hospital setting, but be in more of a community setting. And whether it's a Y or a health and fitness center or boys and girls clubs, it could be any organization, but this is just one that um, 
is kind of cutting edge. There are nurses on site. Uh, people, the physical therapy clinic is adjacent to the regular fitness center, if you will, with no barriers. The patients can walk in between both. So it's quite a, it's quite a novel approach and it's, it seems to be working quite well. So I'm gonna leave you with this slide. So it, this is kind of a summary of, of what you might do. Many times fitness professionals will ask me, well, how can I move in that direction? Or how can I move my center to be one that a healthcare organization like a hospital will want to partner with? So some of it is getting your own shop in order, making sure you have staff that are certified, making sure your facility meets standards, whether it's ACSM or MFA as a medical fitness association that has standards for facilities. And a lot of this is about relationships with providers, find champions, doctors that maybe you have in your membership who are very interested in getting their patients involved in wellness and physical activity programs. Uh, run outcome-based programs, whether it's a diabetes exercise program that you can show uh, specific results from or other kind of programs that are outcome-based. Uh, develop communications with physicians. Uh, you're helping them solve a problem. Uh, many of them want to find resources and programs that they can refer their patients to but are un unaware of resources that might be right under their nose. Increase the visibility of yourself as a professional in terms of lecturing and, and talking about services that your health, uh, your health club or health fitness facility might offer. Obtain those certifications including looking at the exercise of medicine credentialing certifications that might connect you with a network of healthcare providers. And finally, be aware of kind of the language of healthcare, uh, you know, the things that they look at, the things that are important to doctors, uh, such as results and such as education of their patients and, and kind of keeping track of what happens to them and keeping open lines of communication with physicians um, as, you, as you work with their patients. Now I'd like to have uh, Dixie come up and talk about personal training. Thank you. Okay. Ooh. Hi there. Can I see a show of hands? How many people do any form of personal training? Whoa. Okay. Well, we're going to talk a little bit then about personal training, a lot of you. Lynn alluded a little bit um, to the age of some of us up here on the, the stage. And as I was preparing my slides for this, um, I got this email from a former student. And it really just struck me in terms of where personal training evolved from. And I thought that it would be interesting for you to see it as well, because Mason sent me this, this nice little email and then sent me a picture of Joe Hart, who he says, I trained him 30 years ago. <laughs> and I remember Joe really well, but Joe was in a group exercise class that I taught. There wasn't personal training really back then. He was in a group class, but his perception of the care that he got and our interactions was that it was all about him and he felt well taken care of. And I really think that the evolution of personal training has continued along these lines over the years, where in early days we started with group, but there became that desire from many people in our group classes, they wanted to work one-on-one -on -one with us. And so even though we're looking at the future, I thought it was important to set the stage a little bit um, because I see that many of you in the audience are much younger than the rest of us up here on the stage. And just to let you know that there hasn't been personal training um, as we know it for all that long. And so you get to be a part of a, of a relatively new industry. And so I would encourage you to look at the value of mentors as personal trainers. And you should seek out people who you admire and who you respect and who you can learn from. And then you become a mentor to somebody else who is interested in getting into this field and, and contributing to our industry. Um, you really want to look at connecting with people who want to give back. And all of the um, little brands up here are businesses started by former students of mine, and most of them in the, remain in the Austin area. And I really think that in the personal training world, because what we do is one-on-one, -on -one, that this value of mentorship in our industry is really important and powerful, and one that if we are 
are to continue into the future as a strong industry that we need to be mindful of that. So I would encourage um, all of you to um, become a mentor and also continue to learn from those who have invested into you. Um, this, when we look at one-stop shops as we, we address what's coming up in the future, what I believe we're seeing, and I'm staying away from surveys and more looking at, at pictures and stories here, um, these one-stop shops are really the vanguard, I think. Mike alluded to it a little bit with his list of all of the things that you could potentially get at one of these facilities. And I think we're seeing this in personal training as well. Austin Fitness Clinic, for example, you can go there and it is a training facility. And former student started it. He has an undergraduate degree. So for those of you who think that you have to ha go on to graduate work to succeed in the personal training industry, you absolutely don't. So Sam has started Austin Fitness Clinic, and he has contract personal trainers there. And these people pay a monthly fee, and they can train as much or as little as they want. But what he's also done is he has built out his clinic to not just be a personal training studio, but he has a physical therapist who has their practice there. He has an ART person who is housed in this facility. He has massage therapists. He, you can get anything you need in terms of your physical care in one place. And so when you consider growing your own business, I think looking for ways to leverage in the future some of the connectedness to healthcare that Mike just spoke so um, well about is something for all of us to look into as personal trainers to grow our businesses. Secondly, the future contains more, um, I can never say niche, because I'm from Virginia. We said niche growing up, and um, Amanda Vogel says niche. And ever since I heard her say niche, I want to say niche. So niche <laughs> and specialized training. So looking for how do you differentiate yourself? In the personal training world, you need to have specific skills that set you apart. And so this um, this one one brand over here, Functional Sports Therapy and Fitness. Jake does training. He went, he too is an undergraduate student. He went through our undergraduate program. He did massage therapy, and now he does ART. And about 60% of what he does is no longer just personal training, but he's able to move into other realms of what he's um, become credentialed to be able to do. And then another student, um, she is a mom of five children. She had triplets and decided that she needed to be able to work from her home. And she started a personal training business called Backyard Fitness. And her sphere of influence, the people that she interacts with, the people that she connects with through her children, have caused her business to grow exponentially. Then, I think lastly, to talk about the, the future, to think about the value of face-to-face. -face. I am convinced that personal training is going to endure. It barely cracked the top 10, so it used to be higher on those lists that, that different people have shared with you. But I'm convinced that it's going to endure because we crave community and the ability to connect with people face-to-face -face is really powerful. And so if we were to ask the question, is it, are we going from one-on-one -on -one to small group? How many of you also do some small group training in addition to your one-on-one? -on -one? We've changed our whole undergraduate curriculum to not just prepare people for one-on-one, -on -one, but now small group training as well. You have to be able to do both. So it's not either or, it's both and. You need to look at the future of training to not just be individual, but also small group. And when you look at retention rates, a lot of times people say that one-on-one, -on -one, oftentimes you've got your highest retention rates, and yet with your smaller group training, you also have the opportunity to retain not just one person one-on-one, -on -one, but that smaller group because, again, as both of the previous speakers mentioned, that idea of socialization and that ability to create a community. And knowing your clients, knowing yourselves. I have one of my personal training clients up here, and um, I, tr I do in-home training, and she loves her animals. 
if she couldn't take her animals with her to a workout, that workout isn't going to happen. And so knowing your client and understanding would it be appropriate for somebody to move from one-on-one -on -one to a small group, you have to know who it is that you're working with because the future holds both of those and you want to be prepared to do either or both with a given client. And then leveraging technology. Anybody here do online training? Anybody online? So not many hands. I think that is in our future. There is going to be more with this millennial generation. We have more people who are comfortable doing their face-to-face -face electronically. And so learning how to leverage technology for online communication as well as using all of the gadgets and the um, apps that are out there is something that is in all of our futures um, if we remain in the personal training industry. So not a lot of numbers, but a few stories for you. And that will lead into introducing Kelly. So I saw a lot of hands go up for people doing small group training, and that's very exciting. Uh, because there's a huge potential in small group training. Uh, you know, if you look at the economic climate right now, I'm a personal trainer. I own a personal training and small group training studio in Pasadena. And uh, I really see a growth in small group training because of the economic climate. Personal training is a luxury. And as a personal trainer, I will probably always have personal training clients. But um, I do see a, a huge growth. Um, it debuted in the top 20 in 2007 at number 19. It moved to number eight in 2010. Since then, it's remained in the top 20. But I think we will see it continue to kind of move up in, in, the, in those ranges. Interestingly, personal story, my mother, um, my 84-year-old mother, started a small group training workout in Australia in 1990, I would say, four. 94. It was called Healthy Bones, and about six, four to six of my mother's friends showed up in her living room. It's a pretty big living room. Uh, and they uh, got together. They all bought uh, pump equipment. It was called Healthy Bones, but they did pump, um, a version of body pump. And that, that group moved to a scout hall, and it's still going. I know. Yeah, it's pretty impressive. Um, but I think the, the, the instructor was very smart because she knew her, her population. She knew exactly what and who, what she wanted to do and who she wanted to train. And I think that is a very smart approach to small group training because it, it is more personalized than traditional group exercise, but it you really need people with common goals for it to succeed because you can't just write a general exercise prescription because it needs to be more personalized. So looking at, you've got kettlebell camp, boot camp, weight loss, healthy bones, children's and teens, triathlon training camp for off-season training for triathletes, core training for golfers. Golfers are a pretty interesting group of people because if you look at people who play golf, they will spend any amount of money <laughs> to, do, to do better at their sport. And they have time and they have the money to do it. And so that's potentially a huge... Um, a huge source of income for a trainer. Uh, men or women or, or both, active older adults, corporate wellness, tennis conditioning. I've actually done some small group tennis conditioning um, in Pasadena. I was working with uh, Caltech as the strength and conditioning coach for them. Um, of course, Caltech is, you know, they're not known for their tennis, but <laughs> <laughs> they're really known for rocket scientry, but <laughs> uh, it was pretty interesting for me. <laughs> 
So I think there are a lot of business benefits for you as a trainer because you can reach more people in a single session and I think there's a lot to be said about that. It does create a social environment and like Dixie mentioned that the social the socialization uh, in group training is huge because it creates uh, a social support for people to uh, be accountable, not just to you as the trainer, but to each other. They work in teams. It can develop a really progressive program design if you've got people for four to eight weeks at a time in a closed session then you can take people from here to here rather than a drop-in session. Is anyone here doing a closed session with their clients where they start, they buy eight weeks of training or four weeks of training? Is anyone doing that? Or is it just drop-in, drop-out? Drop-in, drop-out? Closed session? Yeah. There's a lot to be said about a closed session because a closed session is where people will buy a certain amount of sessions for a, a, for a closed period of time and they come to those sessions. A drop-in, drop-out uh, situation or environment is where people buy sessions but they come and go as they please. It's harder to build a progressive program with a drop-in, drop-out with a closed session. You can take them from here and build them progressively in more of a either a periodized program where you can really take people from uh, from one point to another. It is typically better than regular group exercise because it is more personalized. It's a smaller group. Um, and so you can build stronger relationships with your clients um, because it is that smaller group situation. It's a huge income uh, potential. Huge income potential. So if you, um, who's a studio owner here? Studio owners? Okay. So this is a really easy situation for um, building your income because if you're also doing personal training, you can schedule your personal training clients in between your groups at off times. So it can really make use of your space. But if you're a studio owner and you have a Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 6 a.m. to 6.45, 8.30 to 9.30, 12 to 12.45, 5.30 to 6.15 and 6.15 to 7. And then Tuesday, Thursday have morning classes. Six people in each class at $15 per person. That's $90 times 15 classes, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, $1,140 for 14 hours of work. So it's a big, it's a, it's a real potential for, to, um, to make some money. Uh, and it's more affordable for the client it's more affordable for the client. So it, it's a win-win situation because if you're doing 18 hours of work, you can earn $1,620, and that's at a price point of $15 a head. So it's very affordable for them, but huge income potential for you as the trainer. Um, I work at a gym called Breakthrough Fitness in Pasadena, and we also have small, a small group training system there. They have three levels of membership. So if you're, on a, if you're a gym owner, this is a very interesting system because it's not just your regular gym situation where you own a membership and then you do personal training because they have three levels of um, access to the club. They have group fitness and just you can come and use the equipment. And then they have a level two, which is um, large group training, which they have a program called MC3, which is um, metabolic conditioning program. And then level three is they have team training um, un and unlimited small group training. They call it team training. And it's six to ten people plus their MC3 plus group fitness plus access to the club. Of course, then you've got clubs like um, Lifetime Fitness. They have a huge small group training business now. They're actually growing that business a lot more than their, um, their personal training. And then clubs like Equinox, which do intermittent small group training, they don't offer it regularly. And I, I, I don't quite understand why not. 24-hour um, uh, fitness also 
offers small group training. So it's really coming also into the big box gyms uh, as well as into the studios. But definitely uh, we see it a lot in studios. So I think if you own a studio and it's just personal training, then you might want to consider bringing in some small groups to uh, use some of your time more efficiently. What Good. questions do we have? Round of applause for Kelly, please. Yes. Good. You know, that was tremendously insightful, and you could hear the, the thought and analyses, you know, of, of our fitness industry, and, and the diversity of which we're growing right now and have room to grow is amazing. But take a minute. Uh, those were all fabulous presentations, and, and they were just put together. They were so incredible. Let's give them a round of applause. It was fabulous. It, it was. It really was. All right, I'm coming to you. Raise your hand. Who's got a question? But we, we want this engaging. So who's got a question right here? Now, with the, ba with the baby boomers coming around, mild cognitive impairment, I mean, what kind of arrangements or improvements? You, do you, are, does anybody have a plan on those as they get older? <laughs> in, 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 in the medical? Enga well, engagement for them, their caretakers. Uh, safety issues. I mean, to me, it's a population that could, is going to be growing. Somewhat of the cardiac rehab world, and where do we fit into that as far as growth? Mike, what, what would you say? So is your question the, the ability to connect with physicians for referrals with cardiac patients as uh, aging? I'm not sure I understand. Sorry. No, mild kind of impairment. I mean, I am a physician, I was saying, and I'm trying to get these people, as we say, and for brain-wise, you want to keep them physically active. And if there's a way to capture some of that population to maintain you know, their abilities to still socialize, get out, and is the why or anybody like that trying to bring some of those in? Well, I think the short answer is yes. You know, we, uh, there's a pretty big awareness in the industry that the old, older adult population ha has a lot of needs physical activity-wise, whether it's injury rehabilitation or starting in physical activity perhaps at a later point in their life than they did. Um, I, I don't know if there's any concerted efforts, if you will, um, that I'm aware of for that, for the older adult population. But I know it's on everyone's radar, and we've heard some different seminars on, on resistance training as a need for older adult population. You mentioned social ability. I think that's a key factor in older adult programming. Physical activity has to have a social element. Uh, many of them have uh, more time, are looking for that part of their life as that, in, in that aspect of wellness, if you will, beyond physical activity. So I think all those factors have to be considered. I'm not sure if I answered it accurately. Somebody else might have some input. I wanted to add one thing, because being a Group X leader grown up from the 80s, a lot of times we think that HIIT training and, and, and much of the stuff that is new is what everybody wants. And I'm seeing some research out there on how STEP is really great for cognitive, you know, that combination of movement and thinking about the movement and many of those people, baby boomers, they grew up with it, they like it. They like the high-low class. So not just throwing out some of the old formats, but thinking about maybe we should bring back you know, a basic choreographed dance class that um, Jackie Sorensen did long ago because that's what they grew up with. And so I think thinking about formatting in terms of age group is a really good thing to do. Good, really good. Dixie, we've got a question for you right here. So, Dixie, how do you differentiate, differentiate yourself as a trainer? Okay, well, um, is this on? Can you guys hear? Yep, now it's on. Um, for most trainers, I think we've alluded to some of the ways that they can differentiate themselves in terms of even what you're talking about, um, that I get to say it again, niche training. So looking for a group of people who you enjoy working with and then becoming highly qualified to be able to work with those individuals. If you enjoy working in the post rehab uh, world, I, I have so many personal training friends in Austin who could send trainers who they trusted 
with their patients who are released from physical therapy, you could have more people on your calendar than you could possibly fit in because PTs are looking for highly qualified individuals. So I think it's um, for, for any industry, you've got to look for, for that niche for yourself and then finding out the ways to become competent in that. So if you want to work with PTs, if you want to get those clients, you need to start hanging out with PTs and learning really strong post-rehabilitative strategies. Um, it's it's de determining ahead of time where is it that you want to work, and then you've got to become qualified to be known as the best in that. And you will never lack for work if, you are, if, you, if you're able to do that, I think. So give the mic to Kelly. Kelly, you've differentiated yourself throughout your entire career. What, what, what has been your plan as, as a professional? I just, I've always followed what I feel really passionate about. Because I think it's really easy to learn something that you are interested in and feel genuinely passionate about. And I totally agree. Live your passion. That wonderful. We have a question for Mike here. I'd like to know, what is the most popular medical fitness program? There you go. You had about 20 of them. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot. I think it's physical therapy uh, by far. Most of the collaborations uh, start that way because it's a, it's a kind of a no-brainer that uh, they look if you have a physical therapy center in a, in a health club or in a Y or in a community center, it's a great place to get people uh, with a physician's referral into that community-based center and out of the hospital. And then from there, it, it, it's a much easier transition. I don't want to make it sound easy because it's really not. It takes a purposeful effort to turn a patient into a member, into a long-term participant. But by being in the center for physical therapy for 12 weeks or whatever the, the duration is and getting exposed to the, the members that are in that center and the pools, uh, the fitness equipment, it's a, it's a much easier transition to turn that person into a long-time uh, fitness or activity provider. So that seems to be the, the thing that initially will connect health and fitness centers with hospitals and healthcare providers. And, and some of it is simply because of the services that are there, there are experts in fitness, and then the, there are facilities that are there. There are warm water pools, or fitness equipment, treadmills, and et cetera, that, that make it uh, easier to make that connection with, uh, with expertise and, uh, and centers and facilities that hospitals m may not necessarily have. Good, excellent. Carol, this is for you. <clears throat> These are, these are my students, not all of them, but some of them. Um, what about these niche, niche orange theory? Is that why we're seeing a bump in a group? Uh, how do you see them and where do you see this going? Wow. Um, you know, I think one of the most innovative things that I've seen recently in group is the class pass. And I think it has really enhanced um, these niche mark niche niche markets, whatever we want to call them. Um, I think it's <laughs> niche. We're, we got a vote going here. Um, <laughs> She's Canadian. Amanda's Canadian. That's the problem. <laughs> so if you if you don't know what class pass is, who knows what class pass is? Okay, if you're in the bigger cities, you know about it. If you don't um, know about it, it is where these niche markets niche markets. Um, Pilates, yoga, Orange Theory um, share um, this pass where you could go to, one day you could go to a yoga, one day you can go to Orange Theory, one day you can go to Pilates, and they all share in the revenue together. So rather than you saying, all I'm going to do is yoga and go to yoga, you have to buy all the yoga passes and maybe you want a little more variety. So I see that class pass as being something that is really going to enhance um, the, all the niche markets that are out there and make the studios smaller. And I think the smaller part has something to do with what Dixie said is the socialization. People want a home. They want to go and say, you know, these are my buds. These, these are the people that I, you know, that I like being around and working with, and you, know, you, you tell all your stories about birthdays and all that, and everybody's celebrating everything. It becomes a community. 
So I think we're going to see a lot more of them because of the community that they tend to build. And, and Carol, this may be to you and Dixie. It's kind of a follow-up. Um, yeah, it's a little bit of a follow-up on the finding a niche or niche, um, but also, um, well, it's kind of a two-part question. Just a really quick background is um, I coach basketball kind of at the middle school and high school level, and um, that's kind of exactly what I did. Um, three years ago, I came and listened to um, one of um, Avery Fagenbaum's uh, speeches on youth fitness, and it just captivated me. I thought that'd be perfect. I could kind of blend the two. And that's, that's what I did. I went and got the um, ACE um, specialty certification as a youth fitness instructor. But then um, there's just not much in that market. I just wondered, uh, on, well, specifically as far as like finding your um, niche, but also um, just for the whole panel, um, what, what are your opinions do you think that youth fitness isn't catching on? Because clearly it's not like the problem's gone away or it's gotten better. So I, I just wondered what your professional opinions are. Wow, fabulous question. Who wants to start that one off? Fabulous question. Yeah, I have a strong opinion on that, and I've, I've dealt with this issue in, in the organization that I work for, the YMCA, and I think where a lot of youth fitness programs go wrong is that they're modeled after adult fitness programs. I think kids are kids, and they need to move and run and have fun and not be put in a structured program. Now, having said that, there is a place for some structured program among kids that want to do that, but I think many parents think that programs that look like adult fitness programs are good for their kids. And I think it's a mistake. I think we get programs, I get, think we get physical activity through programs where kids are. Camping, sports, arts and crafts, you know, whatever the kids, program the kids are in that they like to have fun, I think sneaking activity in is a way to get kids more physically active. And um, actually I feel kind of strongly about that as you might know. <laughs> Anybody else? Go ahead, you go. Okay, so to your specific question in terms of the basketball, I think, um, a lot of times with the programs at least that I'm familiar with, we have a number of really, um, they, they've done really well in Austin. The, the programs that target not just one specific sport, even though there may be a passion towards that sport, they're teaching movement, as Mike said, and they're really trying to, to draw kids in to teach them basic skills. And when the parents buy in, because your client is really the parent, because they're paying the bills, and the kids sometimes aren't necessarily wanting to go, and yet they, they may be your, your most powerful participant once they get there, but it's the parent who's bringing them to you. And so I think a lot of times in the kids' market, I agree with, with all that Mike said, but I think that you're, you're needing to target the parent and have them buy in to what it is you're offering the kids. Because when the parents buy into it, then I think you can begin to attract a broader base of, of the kids who are being brought by the parents. And I, I'm gonna jump in on that because we have a, a program that our, our undergraduate students do on a regular basis at the 300 level. Dr. Ryder here, if you wanna raise your hand, she's in charge of that. And it's called Goal. And what we do is exactly what Dixie said, it's a combination of educating the parents and the kids. So our students work with the kids, but at the same time, the parents might be having a nutritional seminar. So they come together and they work on it together. They might not be in the same place doing the same exercises, but they're go going to bring the kids there anyway. So have something for the parents as well as the kids at the same time, because I don't think we're, we're gonna reach the kids without the parents. So a combination class would be what I would recommend. Excellent. Kelly, this is to you. Um, in small group training, w which a lot of people are just learning, what skills are essential to survive in the highly competitive small group training scene? So uh, someone who's wanting to go into that direction, what are the skills that they should develop? This is a really good question. First of all, I think you really need to know what you're doing. Get, get educated. Get the knowledge you need to work with, to work with someone, whether uh, you know one on one, and then also have group skills. I think you really need to be in in group exercise. You need good rep good charisma. In uh, personal training, you need good rapport, and in small group training, it's a bit of both. 
you need to have good rapport and you need to be charismatic. You need to be a great motivator. And I think knowing exactly who you want to work with and narrowing down doesn't narrow down your options. It actually makes you, it makes it easier to market yourself because you know exactly who you're going after. Yeah, excellent. We have a question from Tony here to Carol and the Dixie because you're both college professors. Uh, uh, where do you see most of your students moving to after they're finished with their education? Are they still moving into personal training or are they moving more in a clinical direction of like physical therapy or uh, physician's assistant? You want me to go first? Wow, great question. Wow. You know, they ask us that every day. <laughs> what are we going to do with this degree? Um, I think it's interesting. One thing that has happened at Indiana University is we are we used to be um, the school of hyper health, physical education, recreation. Um, our physical education program is going away. So we have a new name now. We're the school of public health. So we are naturally becoming more integrated with public health. And our health fitness specialist degree, which is what we named after the certification of ACSM, is now a bachelor's in public health, fitness, and wellness. So we're moving our program more from the one-on-one -on -one to a population-based view. And we're trying really hard to do that while preserving our focus on the one-on-one. -on -one. But obviously, it's going to change a little bit because of the nature of who we have become um, with this transition. So I think it depends on the school, where that school is located, and kind of what, what their focus is. I would agree with that. We've made some changes recently as well, but not, not as drastic as that. The majority of our students want to major in exercise science. And so they come in and they perceive that they are pre-PT, pre PA, pre-OT, pre-med school, or some allied health field. And we have recently gone to an application process for that program because it's, it's, we can't control our numbers because that's where everybody wants to be. And many of those students do go on to do those careers, and yet we encourage our students to take one of our specializations. So we offer specializations in personal training, clinical testing, and we try to give them some practical hands-on skills. And so we do see a lot of students going on to additional school. But as, as you saw, the examples that I used are all students with undergraduate degrees who got great skills at that level. And they're entrepreneurial. They enjoy building business. They don't want to go to more school. And so many of them go on for successful careers that way as well. So I, I think that where we tend to think anymore, oh, you have to go to graduate school to be successful, um, I intentionally use those examples because I know we have some undergraduate students here who may be asking that very question. Yeah, that's very good and great answer, both of you. Carol, I think this is to you here, this question. Uh-oh. Okay. Okay. Yes. So wondering about with the rise of high intensity interval training in the group fitness setting, how do we deal with that when we have individuals with such varying fitness levels? Ooh, how do you individualize group exercise? There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Especially with oh, the high intensity high programs. High intensity. Good job. Kelsey oh boy. did it. Good job. That, that's a tough one. Did you see Barry Franklin's talk? <laughs> well, what did Barry say? Someone tell. Anybody remember about HIT? This is a test of what you learned the first day. Anybody remember? How many of you said he really liked it and he thinks everyone should do it? Okay, how about if you said, okay, be careful with it? Okay. Yeah. That was his oh, message. Yeah, no, no. That, oh, that was right. it. Yeah. He, well, I think he said that obviously um, we know that it's helpful and it can be, but you have to be careful when you're looking at um, some older adults and any conditions that they might have. How you individualize that, that's, that's difficult. Um, but I think it, you really have to give options. If you come tonight to our um, sweat, you're going to see we have two people up there, one giving one option, another giving another. So I think we have to get better because our population is getting broader at giving options. 
And that's, that's not easy to do. It's going to require us to train a little bit harder with doing those kinds of things. Giving options is how we all designed our, our, our first programs. We were always concerned about making sure that everyone had an option that was right for them. And today, they did an outstanding presentation. Let's give them a round of applause. How, how many of you are coming to the Gatorade sweat event? How many? And you can come watch if you don't want to participate, but it's going to be a rock the house event. So you better be there. Thank you all. Thank you all. Have a good rest of the night. Hope to see you in a few minutes. And thank you, Len. Yes, indeed. Good. Wonderful job.